So I'm going to talk about the syntax of O in uh, Gorwa. And before I start, I will uh, first I will talk about some. Uh, I will give some introduction. Then I will uh, treat some problems that I have with the current anal analysis of the marker as a topic marker. Then I will present an alternative analysis where I treat O as a C marker. And then lastly, I will uh, draw some conclusions and uh, touch upon some problems with my analysis. Uh, before I start, I wanted to uh, reference the Endangered Languages Archive at SOAS, uh, the, uploaded by Andrew Harvey, from which I get most of my uh, data. It has a lot of uh, natural as well as elicited speech and uh, this also includes some, or actually many, transcribed and also glossed uh, files. And I will uh, reference these uh, sources in my examples in square brackets. So first of all, uh, the form or the uh, morpheme that I'm, looking, that I'm looking at has two forms, O and A when it follows a high tone. And then there's also two other forms, wo and he, which, uh, may, which seem to have to, to do something with the uh, vowel and consonant uh, they follow, but I am not really sure what these environments entail exactly. Uh, there is a related suffix in iraku, o, and uh, this suffix has a, an allomorph e, and also Kiesling notes that it, uh, he also reconstructs it for a proto-West Rift from which Iraku, Gorwa, uh, Alagua and Borungwe also uh, have arisen, which is uh, on, on the one hand, Ko, which was a background case marker and Ge or E, a locative temporal case marker. And he also notes that there is a predicate suffix in non-verbal predication with this form. In previous literature, uh, Andrew Harvey has analyzed it as a backgrounding enclitic, although he already mentions that there are some problems with it, which I will mention later. And Kerr, 2020, has analyzed it as an indefinite or possibly a non-specificity marker because it can't appear with the demonstrative ka. However, as we can see in one, there is an example where it does appear with ka. You can see here in the word garqai, it follows the demonstrative. Because it follows the demonstrative enclitic, ka here, I say that the uh, marker itself is also an enclitic, although it has been analyzed as a suffix in other literature. Some problems that I have with O as a topic marker. First of all, I will. Uh, try to define a topic, and then uh, I will look at the seemingly disparate morphosyntactic environments identified by Harvey 2018. One interpretation of topic is within a topic comment framework. In this framework, a comment says something about a topic, which is always present either in, uh, either overtly or in uh, non-overtly. In this framework, the correlation between topic and subject is extremely strong on the level of discourse and has important grammatical consequences in English as well as in other languages. However, in Gorwa, O cannot occur on core arguments, as demonstrated in 1b here, where Diri a Babatiro is an ungrammatical sen sentence, and in 2b here, where Heitehe Kiswaili Ros Kaho is or might be grammatical, although only if Haiti is here taken to be separate from the core argument Kiswaili Ros. Defining a topic. Uh, as a frame setter interpretation, this would uh, explain examples such as 2b here, and also explicit frame setters are always focused, according to Krifka and Musan. 
look at uh, example three here, where this is indeed the case. We have here Billy uh, Huerabo, um, which gets the marker and are followed by Fleme, which I take here to be a scalar particle. And as such, this would be a um, focus sensitive particle attracting focus to the constituent over which it has scope, in this case, Billy Huera. However, Harvey, uh, as mentioned before, analyzes the marker as a background information marker, such as in 4A. And it does not necessarily appear on a cons constituent with an influence on truth con conditions, such as 4B here, where the sentence, my wife, me, you, aren't our boys too, me and you, uh, would also hold true outside of the frame of uh, IO here. Now I will look at the disparate environments as uh, mentioned before. Harvey mentions comparisons, elements preceded by UMO, nominal and adjectival negation, and polar questions. Furthermore, Care mentions also that the nominal adjectives and the verbal nouns get the marker, but I will not look at these uh, environments here because that would take more time and it would need too much, uh, it would need more analysis. Comparisons uh, consist of a predicate adjective, such as exemplified in five here, where uh, there is an auxiliary present, in this case, T or Q. And the auxiliary, as uh, Clemens also mentioned before, has a uh, medial passive voice and then is followed by a patient prefix in the case of uh, first and second person and a patient as well as an agent uh, prefix in the case of third person. Both of these prefixes refer to the subject, ani or garma. For comparative constructions, these are followed by a separate uh, comparative clause, in this case, uh, ta garma wo. And as you can see, the first part is exactly the same as the uh, predicative adjectives in uh, example five. And Harvey analyzes this as featuring obligatory ellipses. I say that we can also interpret this as a verbless predicate with marked with O. Elements preceded by UMO also get the, uh, get the marker. And note that here it can also occur on, um, on core arguments such as umoko aitao or uh, aito in uh, 7a where it is marked on the uh, every flower in the sentence bees suck, bees suck every flower and in b on everyone in the sentence everyone would fetch their child we can understand this better if we look at the nature of the word umo um, Harvey analyzes it as an adjective. And here we have uh, an adjective in 8a and a number, uh, number word in 8b. Note that adjectives have gender and number marking, whereas umo does not. And that all nominal modifiers, both uh, adjectives as well as number words, follow the noun whereas umo precedes it. Rather, these are adverbial properties, such as demonstrated in nine, where bili, in the sentence gari ire hwan bili, is taken to be an, ad an adverb, and uh, where I define adverb in the sense of being sister to a bar or a phrase level, rather than modifying a nominal head. Looking again at the examples in seven, we can now understand that uh, the word flower and also the word he, uh, person 
in these examples is cannot be taken just as a nominal head, but must be something of a larger constituent. And as such, this might be this might also explain why these forms do get the uh, enclitic. Nominal and adjectival negations. Negated nominals and adjectives are demonstrated in 10, where we have first a negation of a nominal head, then negation of a nominal phrase, and lastly, negation of, a, of an adjective. The, these forms all have a, have, are marked with the enclitic, followed by a negative marker, K. The same goes for uh, full clauses. Same uh, type of construction. And now there is a problem because in sentences such as uh, example 12, uh, we see that there is an example where uh, the negative enclitic attaches directly to both a, an adjective and a noun, such as sau and yamu here. Rather, the, uh, the marker O is marked on Hababie. And I say here that perhaps this O marker does have scope over the entire thing, uh, saying that the ne negation might in this case also uh, be a clausal rather than a nominal or adjectival negation. This might also be the case for the examples given before. Polar questions, or as CARE 2020 has noted, specifically nominal polar questions, get also the, uh, the marker. We can see that, it, that this is only the case for uh, nominal polar questions in 13, where A is a nominal polar question marked with the, uh, with the enclitic O, and B is a verbal polar question, which is not marked with the enclitic. One exception to this is the verb der in 14, uh, which also get the mark, gets the marker. And this is similar to Iraku, uh, which, is, uh, which also has a verb der, which is analyzed by Maus and Koro as a defective verb sharing some properties with nominals. To summarize what we have seen up to now, um, we have a head, we have a, an enclitic that can be the head of a comparative clause. It can be modified by an adverbial phrase. It has scope over clausal negation or it, it attracts the scope of clausal negation and it marks nominal polar questions. To understand why I now want to mention, uh, why I want to analyze this as a C marker, we have to look at Gorwa's sentence structure at large. First of all, uh, in Harvey 2018, the uh, core argument DP, such as Ani and Tle in example 15, are treated as base generated outside of the TP inside an overarching structure called XP here. This is incompatible in, com in combination with my constraint that the, uh, the enclitic cannot be marked on core arguments. However, in 2019, Harvey suggests that uh, DPs may be actually base generated inside the TP and move outside of it. Um, these DPs can uh, follow, such as in 15A, or precede, such as in 15B, the O marked constituent. Look at Ayo, uh, Aniki, and Matlatlero following Yequa in 15B. And taking from uh, taking this we can now say that we have a clausal constituent on syntactic level comparable to DP and uh, which has 
question and negative morphology, which is part of question and negative morphology on the class level, which is similar to Mauss and Poirot's analysis of O as a scope marking suffix. Furthermore, O is marked on a level higher than the TP, as we have seen before. From this, we can draw some conclusions. Uh, first of all, I think the topic analysis uh, of the enclitic needs some revision. And I think that O marks the right-hand side of a verbless CP. Some other findings that we have is that uh, UMO may be analyzed as an adverb. DER may be analyzed as a defective verb, such as also in Iraqo. And core argument DPs may indeed be base generated inside the TP and move outside of it, such as uh, suggested in Harvey 2019. Some problems with my analysis are that the nominal adjectives and de-verbal nouns have not yet been explained uh, by it, and we will need to look uh, at these in more detail. And the marker does not always occur at the right border, such as in example 12. Another question raised is that uh, a West Cushitic language, arbore, has a, uh, has a suffix ko, which is uh, analyzed as an interrogative copula and which might be related to our o in Gorwa, according to Kiesling. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Yurian. Um, again, uh, I, it's really nice to see um, this uh, marker um, sort of taken into its larger context. There's a lot of interesting data, I think, that's pulled together that I uh, haven't uh, pulled together before. Uh, and it's nice to see some sort of uh, lively um, reflection on uh, things that were said before and things that were said by other people. It's, it's really interesting. I think, I still think it's a devil of a morpheme and it's, uh, and it's, uh, and it's nice that, um, it's nice that it's, uh, that people, uh, including, uh, Liz and, and you are, are sort of taking this, uh, head on and, uh, and, uh, trying to get to the bottom of it. I wonder if we could go back to slide eight. Yeah, sure. Uh, because one of your examples, I can see that it's glossed perhaps problematically. And I hope that this is the first time that this was done. And I know what happened is that I think I shared the Flex database with you. And sometimes when you share the Flex database, um, you get uh, Flex will uh, gloss things in a way that sometimes the glossing changes. Mm -hmm. So... I see in 4B, for example, this IO here. So, you know, oh, IO, ani king takayerin qui at areke, ani ni king. This IO here uh, was somehow glossed as land with a topic marker at the end. Now, I don't think so. What this should probably be glossed as is um, the IO here should at least be, it comes from AI. Which is um, which is mother because he's talking about wife here, so it should be mother. Um, and uh, the O is often for. It's kind of evocative, so it's like my my wife or your wife. Mm -hmm. I O is mother. Um, I don't know if that ruins your um, analysis here that there's a topic marker. Um, I'd need to I'd need to go back and and think. I think that in my lexicon, I've analyzed IE and IO as two different lexical items. Um, but I mean, that doesn't preclude the fact that maybe perhaps the IO actually does have a topic marker at the end. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but this B example here, this 4B, and also you use it on um, in slide 19 uh, as your example 15A, um, that yeah, the, the gloss will have to be changed at the minimum and at the maximum you might need to throw it out because it might not, um, it might not actually support your argument. Yes, thank you. Yeah, but other than that, I mean, this other example is, is, clearly, is clearly a topic marker.
Liz has uh, a comment. She comments, uh, so Liz Kerr has a, has a comment. She mentions, I'd like to see more comparison of how your analysis differs from Mouse and Coro's 2010 analysis of Iraq O. You can also see that a lot of the extra contexts I mentioned are also found in Iraq, which uh, Mouse and Coro work into their account and is interesting for the question of how close Gorba and Iraq are to each other. Yes, I agree. That would, uh, that would be interesting to look at more. I think that that's, yeah, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice comment. Um, and obviously, again, I can make sure that all of these comments arrive to our presenters to make sure that they can sort of pour over them when we're, when we're uh, refining our, our papers. Um, Aranka Van Tol asks, um, is there a reason why UMO is not analyzed as a, uh, as a quantifier rather than an adjective slash adverb? Uh, yeah, quantifiers follow the noun, whereas UMO precedes it. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if Aranka has any, has any follow-ups to ask, but I'll, I'll jump to the next question. If she has any thoughts or, or things to add, I, will, uh, I, can, uh, I can say later on. Yenika van der Waal, uh, asks, uh, so she, she has a comment and then a question, I believe. She says, your analysis as O marking the right boundary of a verbless CP makes clear predictions, one of which is that it would appear with all instances of verbless CPs. So why do we only find it in a subset of these? Hmm. Is, because there are examples, I take it, that do not have it? Yeah, hi. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, any kind of um, uh, nominal predication or nonverbal predication, like um, uh, when you have an adjective being the predica uh, predicate or uh, just a noun being a predicate. So things like uh, she is the teacher or um, he is tall. Um, and those uh, are not as such in the, 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 the list that I've seen uh, of context where we find the, the enclitic, right? No, that's true. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate your, your effort to, trying and to, to try and see what might this be and what kind of uh, node uh, might, this, uh, might this spell out. Um, but I think your, uh, your analysis uh, overgenerates so that would be uh, um, a strong argument to uh, to look elsewhere or to to look a bit harder. So uh, to define more sharply what kind of CP uh, we are dealing with, you mean? Yeah, uh, and whether it's uh, whether it's indeed a, a CP uh, or whether it should be something else. So if if you're right and it has something to do with uh, nonverbal predication. Um, one one area to look uh, would be um, this this sort of predicate phrase uh, as Bowen uh, has proposed. Um, uh, but again, you would you would make that that same prediction. So what kind of what kind of CP would this be? What kind of high head? We we've we've seen polarity heads. We've seen um, uh, um, what is it? Interrogative heads uh, and and all of these kinds of sort of high up in the CP uh, um, things, but um, why, do, why do those need this, this kind of extra marking and why is it only with uh, nonverbal stuff? Yeah. That would be the, I, I, I suppose the next uh, question as, as far as I can understand this, because it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, all right, thank you. Martin uh, has a comment. He says, Umo is fascinating. I think it comes from a noun in construct case. So that would be in, in my analysis, which you're probably a bit more familiar with, Yurian, is um, a noun with a linker at the end. In Iraq, uh, it can also have this O, which is different from Gorwa. By the way, languages often have every before the noun and all after the noun, compare Swahili, um, which does the same thing. Uh, the adverb uh, that Yurian mentioned to compare it with is to me a noun too used as an adjunct. Okay, this is, uh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if you have any comments or thoughts on that, uh, Yurian. Yeah, so um, I have taken there um, 
adverb in that sense to mean a sister to a bar or phrase level rather than a uh, modifier of a head. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> That's an interesting analysis, Martin. I never uh, thought of that uh, before. Um, Liz Kerr also um, mentions, uh, I've changed my account since the draft you saw and agree that non-specificity isn't a direct explanation, although there, that isn't to say that it's completely unrelated. Um, she also sends, it says, uh, Yurian, that she'll send you the revised version after the talk. Thank you very much. So that's nice. I mean, the both of you have um, have an interesting conversation going on. I mean, temporarily, it's it's occurring quite close to each other, but I, I think that makes it quite exciting. Um, Richard has a comment. Uh, he says, there's a similar looking O uh, enclitic uh, in Datoga that comes from the word Orjeda, son, boy, young man, but I think it behaves more like man, dude, girl in English, as in that's cool man, or yeah, girl. It would be interesting to see if there is any overlap. And of course, there's an interesting um, note that that's actually borrowed into, into Gorwa uh, as well. So if people are walking, uh, if you uh, encounter a group of people, you can say Orjod, uh, which is, hey guys, sort of thing. Uh, but but here is interesting in that in that Richard notes that there's this there's this O and and it clearly comes from from the word Orjeda. Yeah. Um, and of course, Datoga and and Gorwa and Iraq are in very close contact and have uh, and have history of uh, of influencing each other's grammar. Um, given that we are at the top of the hour, I think uh, we'll just finish with uh, Yenika's um, Yenika van der Waals. Uh, comment here. Uh, she says the adverb definition at a bar level is heavily dependent on the structural analysis, of course. This is not a definition that can easily be seen or tested or shown. I think that that's, a, that's an, uh, an interesting uh, comment and perhaps a challenge uh, to end on. Um, uh, I will uh, take it in mind. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, and I think I, I will as well. There's there's a lot of interesting uh, comments here that have that have made me scratch my head as well. Um, <clears throat> like I said, now that we're at the top of the hour, I'd I'd like to just thank everybody uh, for uh, showing up and for uh, coming with your questions and your thoughts and your attention. I know it's a it's a, it's all va very valuable time. It's a busy time of year, uh, and it's really great to see um, everybody coming out to support. Um, our uh, our paper writing process and uh, and turning these uh, ideas into good uh, works which we can uh, communicate and move uh, the study of Gorba and indeed the study of African languages and, and language in general uh, forward. Um, it's it's really great to see this level of support and uh, and interest and and so for that to our audience I want to say thank you um, to Richard Griscom I want to say thank you for um, for sort of uh, supporting this. And, and uh, obviously to all of the presenters, I think that uh, you have some brilliant ideas and you've really put a lot of effort and thought into, uh, into your topics. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. And hopefully one day, not too far in the future, we can uh, see them in print in your favorite uh, journal. So thank you very much and uh, do enjoy uh, the rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>